Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for coming uh, to this talk by my wonderful friend James, and uh, who is also a first-time author. I want to tell you three quick things about James. The first is that uh, James's book is about the importance of experience. And I want to vouch for the fact that this guy doesn't just talk the talk, he walks the walk. James and I met 14 years ago, almost to, to this day, on an overnight bus going from Delhi to Rishikesh in India. Um, for those of you who don't know Rishikesh, it's supposed to be sort of the yoga capital of the world. The Beatles went there to see the Maharishi Maharesh. Jerry's ashes are there, etc. And I was, of course, there to go and check myself into an ashram to continue to do the yoga that I was in love with. And James was there to learn about this thing called yoga that he'd heard about but didn't really know what it was. Uh, he said he was going to be there for three days. And after we went into this ashram, he sort of fell in love with the ashtanga and the macrobiotic diet and the meditation and the aura reading and even the homemade colonics and uh, basically decided to stay there for 30 days with me, which is where we became such great friends. So this guy is the real deal. Um, the second thing is that when we were in India, James and I were absolutely love struck not with each other. We actually both had partners, uh, him in London and me in the States, and we're no longer with these people. But we were so bored in the ashram at night, absolutely nothing goes on in an ashram at night, that we would write these incredible love letters to our significant others, and we would read them to each other. That's how bored we were. And I can just tell you that he is the most beautiful writer, so I'm so happy that 14 years later he has written a book. Um, <laughs> and the third thing uh, to tell you, just because it will endear him to you, is that James is about to become a father for the second time. He didn't know if he would be able to make it out here in time before his wife gives birth. So so I'm very happy that he's here. Welcome, James. Thank you, um, thank you Victoria. Um, it's really funny, because I haven't heard that story for um, some time, especially the bit about writing the love letters and reading them to each other, because I've actually found some that I didn't, never got around to sending, and they are, you know those really embarrassing letters that you never sent for a good reason? Um, so I'm touched that you say I was a good writer, but I think I wasn't back then. But anyway, I appreciate that very much. It's great to be back in Mountain View, and I say back because uh, I lived in Palo Alto in 1997, and I have a strong connection to Mountain View, a strong experiential connection to Mountain View, actually, because um, when I was here, I learnt how to scuba dive with the um, Bayview divers. Anyone learn to scuba dive in Mountain View? I have the card. It's the card I've been using on this trip to the States as my ID. So every time I was in, I was in New York before, and I was going to buildings like the Hearst Building and the Condé Nast Building, the Time and Life Building, and they want to see ID. And I gave them the ID of this scuba diving card I have from when I was in my early 20s. I mean, I look like completely different, obviously. Anyway, and that was, I checked this out. It was before Google started. It was a year before Google started. So um, I was here first, all right? <laughs> Thank you for coming, first of all. I really appreciate it. The, um, for those of you that don't have a copy, the book is called Stuffocation. And what I'd like to do is give you an introduction to that and where it, where it came from for me. And the best place, I think, to begin the story of Stuffocation in a talk like this is a place where I think a lot of great stories begin in a, in, in a time of war with a young couple in love. So about 70 years ago, on January the 27th, 1940, war was raging in some parts of Europe. But in London, it was still quiet. It was a quiet night in London. There was snow falling gently. And just out of a, a busy, bustling, noisy dance hall, a man by the name of Jack, wearing a dark suit, a white shirt, and a dicky bow tie, stepped outside with his new bride, Pam. And he turned to Pam and he said to her, come on, let's go home. And they tramped through snow to their first home. They had two rooms. They had a living room and they had a bedroom. The, the kitchen and the bathroom was shared with the other people who lived in the building. A few years later, they had a son, Alan. And when Alan grew too big to share the bedroom with them, they gave him the bedroom. So every night, after Alan had gone to bed, they would make up one of those camp beds. You know those camp beds? They would make up a camp bed in the living room and they would sleep there. And every morning, 
before Anna left for his paper round, he would wake to the, um, the sound of sizzling and the smell of bacon and eggs and sausages and something that English people used to eat called fried bread. And Jack would get up every morning early and make that for Alan. And he did that every day until the day Alan left for university, for Liverpool University in 1962. Now, Alan was the first person in his family ever to go to university. He made the most of it. He, was, um, he played for the university soccer team. Notice that I said soccer. Um, he saw bands that were, f uh, that were hugely famous, but he saw them before they were famous. So, of course, he saw the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. And if you ever meet him, he'll tell you that within five minutes of meeting him. Um, and then he did what most of us do after university. He settled down. He got a job. He got married. He had kids. And I'm one of them. Alan is my father. Jack is my grandfather. This is my backstory. Why am I telling you this? Because in the story of, of our, um, our everyday, workaday family, you can see the story of suffocation. In the story of our very typical family, you can see the shift in circumstances from scarcity to abundance. And you can see the change as well in terms of what that means for our attitudes, our aspirations, and our values. You see, my grandparents, Jack and Pam, they were typical. Um, they lived not so very far from survival mode, as most people did back then, and as 99% of humans had always done since the dawn of time. And my father was typical too. He was a typical materialistic baby boomer. And as a typical materialistic baby boomer, he, one of the key things he did was that he measured his life in many ways in material terms, like the homes he lived in and the cars he drove. And I remember them all from um, in the 70s, kind of boxy sky blue Triumph Toledo. Anyone know what a Triumph Toledo is? But you can picture it, British built, it was okay. And then in the 80s, he moved on to much slicker, sportier, kind of curvier, uh, more imported cars. And he ended the decade in a red Porsche 911. And he was typical too, I think, as, as for his time, in that he grew up believing in the counterintuitive idea which had gained ground in the early 20th century, which was at the very heart of materialism and was sometimes called the American paradox. And that was the idea that if we wanted to have more, we had to spend more. That virtuous circle of materialism that changed circumstances. Now, do you remember the last time you called someone materialistic? Do you, have you done that in the last month? Or have you, you know, I, I asked people this, and most people say nothing. And then, then, this one. Have you thought someone's materialistic in the last month? Okay, and it's quite an insulting thing to think, isn't it, right? You're kind of putting someone down. And, and that makes sense today. But back then, saying someone was materialistic, materialism, wasn't such a bad idea. In fact, it made perfect sense because it offered my father, Alan, and the rest of the baby boomers the straightest route, the straightest road from the scarcity they'd been born into to the abundance that they were helping to create, the abundance and the better world they were making for themselves, for the society around them, and for their children. So I grew up uh, the benefactor of that to a large extent. And I also grew up believing in that idea. And I grew up thinking I would be just like my dad, I would be materialistic. But then something happened. And I think lots of things have happened, and they've all added up to this situation that I call stuffocation. So stuffocation is that feeling you get when you, um, you open up the closet, and it's full of clothes, but you can't find a single thing to wear. It's that feeling you get when you um, root around inside a cupboard, whatever it might be, to find the one thing that you need through a pile of stuff that you don't use. Instead of thinking of more the way we used to, as a good thing, we now think more means more hassle, more to store, more to manage, more to think about. More isn't better anymore, it's worse. 
I think, overwhelmed, suffocating from stuff, we're feeling suffocation. Why isn't materialism working anymore? Now, as, as with anything, as, uh, as, as, as I think, seismic of suffocation, there are loads of different answers. If you ask a different expert, you'll get a different emphasis. So a philosopher might say that it's to do with status anxiety. We've had enough of stuff because we've had enough of the status anxiety that comes with materialistic consumerism. A psychologist like Oliver James might say it's affluenza. We've had enough of stuff because, we've, because it's giving us affluenza. Mass consumption is leading to mass depression. And a political scientist might say it's because of the stable society. We've, we, we're just not so bothered about stuff anymore because we know that we're going to have a roof over our heads tonight and there's going to be food on the table tomorrow. We're just, we're, we're just not so bothered about the basic materialist concerns anymore. We've climbed that first stage of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. An anthropologist might say, and I'm going to quote here from the Center on the Everyday Lives of People based in Los Angeles, which has just completed the most comprehensive report ever conducted into how people are living uh, today. And they said that we, are, um, that we have uh, more material things than any preceding society. They use the term light years more possessions than any preceding society in human history, that we're um, struggling under material saturation, that we're coping with extraordinary clutter, and that we're in the middle of a clutter crisis. And a technologist might, I think, smile at all these ideas and say, yeah, sure, status anxiety, affluenza, the stable society, clutter crisis. This is all relevant as to why we've had enough of stuff. But the real reason that we're moving on from material things is because we can. Why have a room full of Encyclopedia Britannicas when you can search for the answer you're looking for through, there's a search engine called Google you can use. Worth a try, that joke, right? <laughs> Ooh, that's why I'm a writer, not a comedian. Anyway, but thanks. Um, but, but why have a car? Why have a second car? Why have a car when you can use Zipcar or you can use Uber? Why have a suitcase full of books when you go on holiday? For those of you that went on holiday in the 70s and the 80s, it was a really challenge about which books were you going to take with you. But why do that? I thought I had my Kindle. When you can have a Kindle. I think you know what it looks like anyway, right? But that, you know, thousands of books. Why have a room full of books? Um, I think all of these reasons is partly responsible for stuffication. But if you think about them, I think what's really interesting about them is none of them are blips. Now, none of them are blips that are here one year and likely to be gone the next. I think they're all observable, observed long-term trends. And that's why I think suffocation is going to be the defining problem of the 21st century. So how do you solve a problem like suffocation? Now my job, the job of a, a trend forecaster, not comedian as we've already established, is fascinating. It gives, um, it gives me really interesting um, insights, gives me a really unique viewpoint, and it opens me up to a lot of ridicule. As Yogi Berra said, um, it's hard to make predictions, particularly about the future. And the thing is, if you're going to make a prediction, if you're going to say something's going to happen in the future, at the very least, you better have a decent methodology. So, I don't look into a crystal ball, and I don't read tea leaves, and I've tried, maybe in Rishikesh. And I don't um, breathe in vapours like the oracle at Delphi. The, the method I use is far less ancient, but I think it's, a lot, um, it's far more robust. It's inspired by something a futurist called William Gibson once said, that the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. And it's informed by a way of reading cultural change, which has been applied more than 5,000 times since it was first uh, codified by a sociologist called Everett Rogers at Iowa State University in 1962. Some of you will have heard of it. It's the diffusion of innovations. And it's a way of reading cultural change that, that works out how ideas, innovations, new ways of living, working, cooking, whatever it might be, spread from the innovators, the few innovators, to the early adopters, the early majority, late majority, and laggards. So my job 
is to spot the future here in the present. It's to identify the innovators and the innovations, the big ideas that are going to catch on and spread from these few people to the many in the mainstream. So I've, I've looked all around the world looking for the answer, looking to understand this problem better and to find an idea which I think has the power, has the, the legs, has the ability to move from these few to these many. And as you can imagine, I've run up many blind alleys, I've kind of come to lots of dead ends and all kinds of things that I thought were the answer. Minimalism is a great example. But there's, of all the things that I've looked at, and the book is to a large extent a kind of process of me going through this, this one, is, does this work, this one, does it work? I've come across one idea which I think is going to catch on and become dominant. I call it experientialism. And the people who live this way, experientialists. So the experientialists, instead of, uh, instead of looking for status, identity, happiness and meaning in material things, like materialists did, experientialists are finding status, identity, happiness and meaning in experiences instead. Now, experientialism, and I've said it a lot of times, I think can solve a problem like suffocation. More importantly, experientialism, I believe, will solve suffocation. And I say that because, firstly, it's better. It's just better than materialism, at giving us status, giving us identity, giving us meaning in our lives, and making us happy. But more important than that, more important than being better, I've seen the signs. I've seen the evidence. Even if, even if it's still unevenly distributed, that we are moving away from materialism and that experientialism is making the leap from the innovative few to the many in the mainstream. So first up, there's the evidence that shows that our attitudes are changing. There's a guy called Ron Inglehart. He's a political scientist at the University of Michigan. And based on a hunch that Ron had back in 1969, he started studying our attitudes. And in 1970, he found that 80% of people were materialistic in Western countries. Now, in today's world, it's 50%. So you can see very clearly there is long-term decline in how materialistic we are. And I think where it's really interesting is that as well as our attitudes changing, there is now evidence that our behaviour is changing as well. There's a guy called Chris Goodall. He's a, a Cambridge grad. He was a McKinsey consultant and he taught um, economics at Harvard for a time. He has analysed the material flows, the flow of materials through Western economies. So looking at the States and the UK, for example, and he's discovered that we are consuming less stuff, less paper, concrete, cars, steel, fertilizers, electricity. He's happy, he's happy having seen all this, this evidence to conclude that we've reached the point of peak stuff and that we're now passing that point. Now besides those, there's technology. And I mean technology in terms of wearable tech, uh, for example, the quantified self movement, life logging, and social media. All of these things make our lives much more connected, much more trackable, and much more shareable. I imagine you're aware of this, right? What's really interesting for me about all these technologies, in particular, I think the, the social aspect of it, social media, is they're fundamentally changing how we express our identities and we get status. So go back to the 20th century. The best way to get status and express your identity in the 20th century was through the stuff you owned. Handbag, car, shoes, whatever it might be. Not from what you did. Because back then, who knew that you'd been to um, Utah or Tahoe skiing for the weekend? Who knew you'd been to Marrakesh on your vacation? Who knew you'd been to a really great talk from a trend forecaster at lunchtime? Thank you for staying with me there. I appreciate that. Uh, my wife says that was a funny joke, but there you go. Um, but the thing is, in today's world, with all your followers on uh, Twitter, Instagram, Google+, 
and Facebook, your fr friends, fans, followers, they do. So now, if you uh, take a picture from the chairlift in Squaw Valley or Park City, or if you take a picture of the sun setting behind the Atlas Mountains from the rooftop of your Riyadh in Marrakesh, or you even tweet a quote from something you heard at a talk at lunchtime. And this matters. This matters because it matters for how we express our identities and we get our status. And that matters for people because status and identity matters, right? And social media and this technology matters for the rise of experientialism because this isn't the innovative few anymore. There are hundreds of millions of people using Instagram and Twitter and Google+. There's 1.2 billion people on Facebook. That's as many people as are in the Catholic Church who are expressing their identities and getting their status not from what they do, not from what they have, but from what they do. And this matters, I believe, for you, for me, and for all of us. And the question is, I guess, how? About 12 years ago, on January 27th, 2002, my father brought my grandparents, Jack and Pam, over for lunch to my, my new apartment. It was my first home. It was in Brixton in South London. And it had um, three bedrooms. I had a, a living room, I had a separate dining room, a separate kitchen, I had this great big um, uh, west-facing garden. It was awesome for parties. It was a great first home. And they came over for lunch, and I had a job in advertising at the time. I was, um, I think I was a bit gung-ho, talking quite big about how successful I was and was going to be. And um, just before they left, my grandfather handed me an envelope. And um, just after they left, I opened it, as you can imagine. And it, and it had a note in it, and it had on it, 27-1-2002. He wrote the date the British way with the date and then the month. So 27-1-2002. On this date in 1940, Nana and I tramped through snow to our first home. Memories live longer than dreams. Good luck. And a little bit later, um, I think probably like 20, 25 minutes later, my father was just driving back, just starting to cross the River Thames. He was, it was a black 5 Series BMW, if you're keeping up with the cars of my father. And um, my grandfather choked, <clears throat> and he kind of collapsed in his seat. My father obviously stopped. And um, then he uh, drove as fast as he could. He jumped lights. He actually he got pulled over and then got a police escort and did everything he could to get my grandfather to a hospital as quickly as possible. Um, and he, he, yeah, he did what he could, but my grandfather died that day. And um, obviously, I thought about the note that he gave me quite a lot since then. Um, I, first of all, did he, did he know that he was going to die that day when he gave me that note? And what did he mean by memories live longer than dreams? Did he mean, did he mean that the past is not as good as the future? Or did he mean, as I've come to believe, that, that material dreams are all well and good, but life is made up of memories which come from experiences? Now, whatever he meant, it was quite a passing shot in those, in those final moments to address the most important question a person can ask, the, the question that Aristotle asked in the, in the Nicomachean Ethics almost two and a half thousand years ago, the question that every one of us should ask as, as individuals, as parents, uh, as influential people who market stuff and change the world, being citizens or where we work, whatever it might be. And the question is, I think you know the question, right? How should we live in order to be happy? And in the 20th century, I think the answer to that in many ways was clear. You should be materialistic because that was creating that abundance for everybody. And I think in the 21st century, when our problem isn't scarcity, our problem is abundance. And I think so much abundance that this time of stuffocation, I think the, que the answer has fundamentally changed. So the story of stuffocation ends with you. What are you going to do 
about the most pressing problem of our time. There are three things you can do to try out experientialism. Three steps. First step, de-stuffocate. Step two, don't re-stuffocate. Once you've gone through the bother of getting rid of all that stuff you don't wear, you don't need, you don't use, and it's so easy to go out when you've, you know, you've created space in your closet or on your shelf, because we've been trained to be consumers to do that. But it's really important not to go out and buy more stuff you don't need, you don't use, you don't wear. But for me, step three is the best bit. Because one and two are just hygiene factors, they're just starting points. Step three is a game. And it's a game I like to think of as the Brewster's Millions game. Some of you probably won't have read the 1902 novel or seen the 1985 movie. Anyone got no idea what Brewster's Millions is? All right. Oh, a few of you, okay. It only gets th uh, 6, 6.4 out of 10 on IMDb, which is a crying shame, and it's wrong. It's a great movie. Anyway, so Brewster's Millions, the movie, is about this guy who has to spend $30 million in a month and have nothing physical, tangible to show for it. Now, to play the game properly, you don't have to spend $30 million in a month. Unless you have it, that's, that's obviously your choice. <laughs> but what you do have to do to play the game properly and to really experience the benefits is to spend the same amount of money that you'd spend in a normal month, but have nothing physical, tangible to show for it at the end. And that's all you have to do to join the experientialists. And if you do that, I promise you, you'll have, you'll have more stories, you'll have more status, you'll be happier. Life will feel like it has a lot more meaning. But more than that, even more than that, I think you'll be one of the pioneers. I think you'll be one of the pioneers leading the rest of society out of the storm of suffocation on the straightest, most positive, most aspirational, most fun route to a better world. And I think you'll be one of the pioneers leading um, the rest of America, the rest of the West, the rest of the world, from the old age of materialism to this new era of experientialism. And more than that even, I think you'll understand what my grandfather Jack meant, that memories live longer than dreams. Thank you. Questions, if anyone has any. So, so if we take this to the end and er everybody becomes de de stuffified and we're so good at it that everybody around the world becomes de stuffified, de stuffified, de stuffified. Destuffocated, um, but then I like, I, de I like your yeah, sorry, thank you. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So then what happens to Google? Great question, I think. I don't, okay, so I'm just going to repeat that back to you. If everyone becomes de stuffified, <laughs> Um, what happens to Google? Well, can it's, you be, can so, you be so a little I guess more specific? Because I know, it's, it's I a little, I know what you're it, saying. But. It's, it's a little bit of, like, if you, take it, if you take it to its purest end, like, we need to go to the grocery store. We need, we need stuff, certain stuff. Um, and so what kinds of things do you, I guess what I'm confused about in implementing this in my own life is what do you spend money on? It's kind of a riddle. What do you, have, what do you spend money on and have nothing to show for it? Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's a great question. So, how do you uh, spend money and not end up with something at the end? Um, when did you last go on holiday? Uh, Friday. Oh, great. <laughs> Friday. Okay. No. Pr bring the mic. Please give the man mic. Where did you go? Um, I went and bought a new car. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can I uh, just get, just to get a little bit of clarity here? That's not playing the game. <laughs> All right. A holiday is not buying a car. There are two quite different. I mean, you've actually picked up on two very brilliant examples of different purchases. I have a car and I take holidays. I would consider one of those, don't get me wrong, it's, it gives me experiences, but one is quite a material purchase. The thing about not having anything at the end of it, a great example is a holiday. That's why I wanted to follow down that route. I didn't know you were going to play nasty. <laughs> um, so let's say, uh, let's say you go skiing for a week. 
What do you have? At the, what do you have physical at the end of it? You might have some pictures on your telephone, but really, what you've had is a great time. Well, let's say you go on a, a stag party, which is a, a what do you call it over here? Um, bachelor party. You don't take any pictures, right? <laughs> but and you have an amazing time. It gives you um, status and identity are very you know quite, quite closely connected. It gives you a real identity. It gives you hopefully some happiness. You've had a good time. If you can remember any of it. And um, it gives life a sense of meaning. But you don't come back from it with a whole bunch of stuff, do you? Hopefully you've lost stuff. I mean, anyway. Yeah, right, so, right, right. so it's just to be really clear here. So, so in terms of what I mean by experience is, is that which is something where you're doing something rather than having something. That's the, that's the kind of classic distinction. There's um, two psychologists called uh, Lee Van Boven and, and uh, Tom Gilovich, and they uh, had a paper they um, published in 2003 called To Do or To Have, That Is The Question. And it, was, it is considered to be the kind of classic moment in, um, in research to, to define for the first time whether material goods or experiential goods gave people more happiness. And they proved for the first time that experiential goods gave people more happiness. But to begin that piece of research, they started by saying, what's a material good, what's an experiential good? Because for some people, a TV is experiential and some people it's material. Just to be really clear, this is not anti-consumerist, it's not anti-capitalist, it's not even anti-stuff. It's totally pro-consumerist, pro-capitalist. And it's not anti-stuff, it's having stuff. We bought a bread maker a couple of weeks ago. Now that it has got the potential to be a waste of money. But my wife insists that we will use it and we, we fully intend to, in which case it's, it's got use, right? So it's not anti-having stuff, it's anti-having too much stuff. Um, has that answered your question? Uh, that, that does, yeah. I, I, know, I now know how to implement your three principles. Great, thank you. thank you. Good. Hi, I think you make some very interesting points. I mean, I can relate to what you say in terms of, I think my parents led a, lived a simpler life than me. My grandparents lived even a simpler life, and they were happier. They were more social, they interacted with more people, they have fewer things. Um, another trend I, trend I have seen over the past, in my generation, is not just materialism, but it's also boredom. People are just bored. We have so many things to do. We, are, we have more to do, but we are always bored. I've never heard that word from my previous generations. So do you see a correlation between the two? It's a great question that no one has asked me in, um, in, in any presentation I've given. So you're, can I just say it back to you? You're saying there are so many things to do, we're bored. It's a People get bored with their job. They have more opportunity, but they're, every, every third person you talk to, they're like, I'm so bored with my job. Whereas if I look at my uncle who worked at the same place for 30 years, he never used the term bored. They were just happy doing what they did. So. I really don't know if I, I really like to give a good answer generally, but I don't know if I have an answer because I think having loads of possibilities I mean, boredom is your own responsibility, right? I mean, you know, it comes to the weekend and you've got a choice of, especially where you guys live, right? There's so many outdoor activities you can do or you can go to San Francisco and, I mean, the, the world's kind of here. There's so many things we can do now. I think being bored is, is terrible and if you're bored of your job, you should do a different job. I personally am enthused by my job and it's been my experience of the people that i I was in New York for a few days and I've, I've now been here in California for a few days and everyone I've talked to seems to be really fired up. We went to a great Super Bowl party and um, yeah, just, I don't know, no one seemed bored at all. I don't know, is this a general malaise? Because there's so many, okay, because I would have thought if you've got more things to do, it's just a question of having the, you know, there are challenges with attention, absolutely no doubt about that. There are challenges with sticking with something long enough to enjoy it. But I, I, I don't know if I can answer that better than that. It's probably related to lack of attention span. Over time, we have lost the attention span with so many things around us. And kind of like, uh, like you said, we open our closet, but we don't like anything. And it's like, what is it that we are looking for? We just, we have lost that to some extent. Well, you can become a kind of zombie consumer and you just buy more stuff because you think it's going to solve problems and you kind of, you know, turn to retail therapy. But that's... The truth about retail therapy in terms of buying stuff, it won't make you any happier. But if you buy an experiential good, like going on a rock climbing course, you'll be so scared you won't be able to be bored. Yeah. So if you're bored, go rock climbing or skiing or surfing. That's frightening too, huh? I guess what's different, 
with social media now, uh, I guess replacing some of the materialistic aspects of uh, that, let's say, is different from, let's say, coming back with a bunch of slides or coming back with some videos I took, uh, I took on my camcorder? Okay, great question. Thank you. I think this is this kind of comes to the the heart of why social media is important here. If you, um, I'm going to guess that you're in your twenties, right? Uh, just like that. Okay. So if you went on holiday in the nineties, okay, or, or your friends, you ever remember going around to a friend's house in the nineties, and they would pull out their holiday snaps, and there was that awful moment where you think, oh god, and they'd show you a picture of you know Jean at the Acropolis, and then Jean eating a souvlaki, and then Jean doing something else. How painfully dull was that, right? And it took them, if you think about it, how long did it take for them to share their holiday with people? Because they would have had to have not just you round, all their other friends. So let's say, let's say it's, it's the 90s and you go on a really incredible holiday. Let's say you go to Greece and you're really excited about it and you go see the ruins, etc. And you want to tell a hundred of your best friends about your holiday. And let's say you, you, you know, it's hard to do it at a party, so you need to see them at dinner or at kind of personal drinks, right? So let's say you, you can manage six people at a time. Stay with me here for the maths, right? So you've got to see, you've got to have 10, 15 different arrangements to see people. 15, something like that. That takes a long time. It takes like a couple of months to share with people your experiences. And that, you know, whereas today, you can post it on Facebook and you've got your 500, 600 friends that are right there that can see it. So what social media has done has catalyzed that opportunity to share what you're doing. So if you just run a Tough Mudder course, and I think this is one of the reasons why Tough Mudder is, is increasing so quickly, um, you can instantly share that with people. And that has a real impact on how you see yourself. It has a real impact on how you present yourselves to others. So that's what, that's what social media has done. And whether it's you know, I constantly hear about this thing about, you know, Facebook, it'll be something else next. I don't think, it doesn't matter which, which platform it is that people are using. We now are used to the idea of social media. It will stay with us. Now, that means there's been a fundamental shift from having things to doing things in terms of expressing our identities. So uh, I'm a millennial, um, a group about whom uh, our consumer behavior as much has been speculated. We are the group least likely to buy a car now, least likely to buy a house, and... Uh, I always like get a little wary when I hear about how people are like, oh, your generation just values uh, you know, Instagram and social media and you like experiences more than things because you just like sharing your every thought on Facebook. Uh, mostly it's actually because I think we're less likely to buy cars because like me, instead you're spending the equivalent of a brand new BMW S series on your education. And so it's not so much that I like Instagramming photos for my bike ride more as I feel like I have actually like less money to spend on stuff. And so I'm wondering what kind of what the recession you feel might play in, into this kind of movement away from stuff, how you think it's maybe going to be different for people from my generation for whom, you know, things are just going to become less part of the picture because of the rising cost of other things like healthcare, like education. And uh, whether or not you think then that like some of your advice on how you would implement those three steps would be different. It's a good question. It's quite. I think you've asked me quite a lot of things there. So I'm going to I'm going to try and say it back to you. No, no, it's fine. It's really interesting. Um, especially since you are a millennial, it's very easy for me to stand here and say millennials are doing this, but you are a millennial. Um, so you're asking me how should a millennial implement those three steps, and how um, that was your final part of that question, I think. But before that, you were saying I think. What do I think about uh, education? Where does education fit into this? And you know, in the economy, as I say, education and the economy, and how does that affect millennials and this shift from materialism to experientialism? Yeah, like I'm wondering if you've uh, kind of what, how you see the recession and rising cost of education as factoring into people's choice not to buy things. Yeah. Okay. So. All right. So um, the economy is a really complicated one, to be frank with you, because uh, it's certainly something I would never try and forecast because there's, there's so much. Yeah. Um, and in terms of how it affects people, I think it's really interesting because if you grow up, there's a particular time of your life and if there is a recession or there's a lack of money in your family around that time, you become much more materialistic than other people. So, you know, this kind of broad brush approach that the boomers were this and the millennials are this and Gen X are like this is 
it's quite broad brush, you know, generalizations, and there will be different people within that. My brother and I are two years apart, and he is far more materialistic than me, because just not long after my father having that, that Porsche, his company disappeared, and therefore all the money did as well. And therefore my brother went through a, a crucial period where we had no money, and therefore he's much more materialistic than I am. So the economy will affect this in an interesting way, and that some people will feel less stable and therefore will become more materialistic. But we've also had recessions before, though that kind of comes and goes. And I don't, don't know if you know Nate Silver's The Signal and the Noise, but if you consider how forecasting works and the way that trends work, you may get consider that idea that there were 80% of people that were materialistic and now it's 50%. Within that time, it will go up and down a bit. So I think there is still a long-term trend. In terms of education, I would say education is a great example of an experiential good. It's not tangible. I don't know what, what your educational situation is, but for those of us that have a degree of, you know, the first level, next level, or a doctorate, you can't, you have, I mean, how many of us have the, um, do you get certificates over here? Do you keep them? I mean, I have no idea what my certificates are. I don't know what, I, I don't think my mum has them even. But, you know, it, it's very much an experiential good. It's not a material good. It's not a kind of solid thing. Um, and as a millennial, in terms of those three ideas, I don't actually think it makes a difference what age or who you are. The simple aspect of it is, if you want to be happier, and the research is fascinating, if you look at the research about experiential versus material goods, one great example is that people are happier if they talk about experiences. And we're also, we enjoy listening to people that talk about experiences more. So on that basis, if you've got a choice on a, you're feeling bored on a Saturday morning, go spend your money and time doing an experience. You'll be happier because you'll be doing it. You'll be happier because you, when you talk to people about it, you'll be happier. And you'll have more friends because people will want to listen to you more. So an experiential good is so much more positive. The other aspect about a material, uh, an experiential good, as opposed to a material good, is have you ever bought a pair of shoes that squeak when you walk in them? Or those trousers that seem to swish or a coat? What do you do with those shoes? All those things. You wear them for it, but they annoy you, right? You never want to wear them. Eventually you throw them away, don't you? Or do you just squeak? Or maybe you do. <laughs> the thing about a material good, if you buy a material good and it's, not, and it's not very good, there's nothing you can do about it. You bought a bad good, that's it. If you have an experience that goes wrong, the bus trip across, I was gonna say the bus trip across India is what I used to wear, but that, since that was a fun bus trip, but you know, the, you know that bus trip across India or Peru or Colombia uh, or Thailand where it all goes wrong? Have you all been on one of those? The person next to you was sick, or some other unpleasant thing was happening. The windows wouldn't shut, or they wouldn't open. It was too hot, too cold. You were sick. It all went wrong. It was supposed to last two hours. It took three days. Have you all been on one of those trips? And how bad was it at the time? And how amazing is it now? And that's the funny thing about experiences. If you buy an experience and it's really bad, it's actually brilliant. So my advice to you would be um, shift from material things to experiences. Yeah. And it has a lot of other knock-on effects as well, the, the environment, for example. Um, but yeah, those are reasons. I'm wondering how you not get suffocated by the stuff of experience. So for example, if you go skiing, you have the skis, you might have the scuba gear, you have the bread maker, you have all that stuff, right? Maybe you go to Thailand and you buy that beautiful painting, but you went to Peru and you bought this other thing. All of a sudden, your house is full of stuff, but it's all related to experience. So how do you not get suffocated? That is a great question. <laughs> and there's, it's funny, there's, there's a bit in the book where I kind of really take that on. There's a, uh, a guy in the book called Ben Howe. He's an Australian. And if you go to his house in um, Adelaide in South Australia, he's got a really regular house. If anything, it's, it's, a, it's not messy, but it's not completed. That's how, you know, you walk into your friend's house, sometimes you think, how long have you lived here? And they, you think they've been there a month, but they've been there years. Anyway, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of that. And it, um, but you go to the garage, and you put up the kind of rickety door. It's full of stuff. It's got his motorbike in there. It's got his kite surfing kit. It's got his windsurfing kit. It's got his rock climbing kit. It's got his skiing kit. I'm not anti-stuff. The message of stuffication is not anti-stuff. It's anti-too much stuff. It's, an, it's anti a focus on stuff. I wish I hadn't mentioned the bread maker because that really is stuff. But anyway, the smell of fresh bread, you know, it's a lovely thing. But it's, you know, if you want to ski, you have to have things to do that. At the same time, a walk in the park is an experience you can have and don't need a lot of stuff apart from feet. 
And if you look at statistics, if you live near a park, you will be happier. You know, it's just one of those, those facts. So, and you mentioned they're going to Peru and buying the painting. You don't have to buy that painting. Well, I've been to Peru. I have no paintings. And I re- <laughs> Uh, no, uh, no paintings from Peru. I'm, you know, I have a couple of paintings. But, um, and I remember it really well. I, I heard a howler monkey, for example. And this was certainly in an, in an era before I had a telephone that could record sounds. But I can remember the sound of that surreal howler monkey to this day. Um, I haven't talked about that howler monkey for about a decade. So thank you for bringing that back to me. So, so, you know, but you don't need to have stuff to have an experience. Although the two sometimes come together. Could there be too many experiences to the point where like the value of them is lessened because you're doing so many things? Like I think my life has shifted in that way. I don't have a car. I've lived in so many different places so I could always purge and I'm always Tahoe or Europe or whatever. But like maybe you're searching for something big, like bigger the next time. Like could it dull, you know, what's important and what makes you happy? Yeah, thank you. It's a really good question as well. And it's really interesting talking to people that move country a lot they get this so quickly because they do the country move purge all the time. So that, and, they've, and by definition of moving from one country to another, they're appreciating the experience of going to another country. So they tend to be more interested in this kind of thing. Um, and I, I've, done a, I've uh, spent a couple of ski seasons in the mountains. At the end of sort of five months of being in a ski resort, I have to be honest, it sort of loses some of its fizz compared to right at the beginning. And um, for someone who's got so many experiences that you're starting to get dulled by experiences that is a great problem to have and that's let's be really clear here stuffocation is a fantastic problem to have scarcity not having enough is a horrible problem to have actually and I'm not saying this is for everyone in the world this is for rich western countries other countries are you know they don't have nearly the abundance that we have per capita, but as, you know, as, as, as a whole country. So stuffocation is a great problem to have. If you get to the point where you've done wing walking, you've, I don't know, you've, you've flown in helicopters, you've been, in, um, you've been skiing in Kashmir, you know, you spent time with monkeys, whatever it might be, right? If you've got to the point where you're stuffocated with experience, are you saying you're, you're at that point now? No, I just wonder All right. Because I'd say that is an am- that's an amazing problem to have. The, um, and if you get, but I mean, that is, would really be a great problem to have. But the thing is as well here is that there's an element of the material versus the experiential choice being a first level heuristic, a kind of simple way of, of making the right choice. Because one of the key things about this actually is, is it extrinsic or is it intrinsic in terms of how you make the decision? So if you buy a material good for yourself, so... I'm not trying to show off to you about my bread maker. I really mean that. I'm buying the bread maker because we've discussed it and we think we will enjoy having that experience. And, and fresh bread's really expensive in London, by the way. So I don't know why I'm fixating on this bread maker, but we, we've made the decision for us. We're not doing it as an extrinsic thing to say to her, hey, look at us, we've got a bread maker. And it can be the same with experiences. You know those people who will go to the place to go on holiday. They'll read uh, a magazine and go, that's the place I have to go on holiday because then I can tell people I've been there. And you know those people? You all have friends like that or acquaintances. You don't get as much pleasure if you buy that experiential good for an extrinsic reason if, than if you buy it for an intrinsic reason. But, and this is why I like the, the distinction between material and experiential decisions. Even if you buy that experiential good to show off to other people, for, you know, to, to tell people who you are rather than doing it for yourself, you'll still be doing that thing. Let's say you've decided that um, you have to ski in Squaw Valley for the sake of argument, now there's snow there. You've decided that you have to do that so you can tell your friends you've done it. You'll still be skiing in Squaw Valley. Do you see what I mean? So that's why I think that distinction works. But if you get to that point of suffocated with experiences, let's definitely talk. Isn't the risk that we are replacing one problem with just another, with stuffing our lives with experiences? And um, actually, our time is much more limited than the space we have. So is it a better way to live your life, actually? Or should we actually look for even other answer, like 
time to think and not just to gather experiences, going for holidays, um, to new restaurants and so on? It's a really good question, thank you. And often uh, when I'm explaining this and I give a talk on this, I, get t I tend to talk about things that you do, actively do, because partly it's, it's easier to visualise and it makes it a bit more interesting to listen to. But sitting, thinking, is an experience, as far as I'm concerned. And I don't think that we're replacing one problem with another. I think we're replacing one problem with something that was exponentially better. And I agree with you that we only have so much time, and experiences take time. But that's life. And the choice of experiences that you do are the choice of what you do with your time. That's what you do with your life, right? As opposed to you're saying that, you know, there's more space. I mean, I don't have a lot of, you know, we have more space for stuff. And therefore, we should spend money on stuff because we've got lots of space. Well, I mean, if you look at demographics and the urbanization of the world, we have less space. You know, there's 7 billion people, it might be 9 billion by 2050. Uh, you know, more people living in cities, less space. So I think we have less space, but I think the most important part of your question was about time. The other thing about experientialism, it is a focus on what you do with your time. It's about your experiences and what could be more important than what you do with your time as opposed to the stuff you buy. So in terms of the, re the, the refocus from material things to experiences, I think there's a refocus on life and what matters. My question is about how do you think, um, so people becoming less and less materialistic compared to even 40 years ago, as Mr. Inglehart, right, yeah. correct, um, said. So how do you think it's going to influence um, job market? Because not all of us can, you know, make living writing programs or writing books. Some of us, for example, enjoy creating stuff and like sewing or something like that. So if we're going to be less materialistic, is that going to become a problem for people who are making their living um, while well, producing stuff and selling stuff? It's a, it's a very interesting aspect of the problem of materialism and the, the, the you know, defining problem of stuffication and the shift from the material to the experiential economy is what's going to happen to some industries. With, with any change, there are winners and there are losers. You ever heard of a guy called Ned Ludd, who, who led the Luddites? You ever heard the phrase, the Luddites? So when the Industrial Revolution got going in the UK, this guy in the north of England smashed some of the, of the machines. He may have just been drunk, it turns out. He may have not been protesting at all. They, apparently, if you look into it, it's really odd. But they, he became their hero, and they called themselves Luddites because those machines were taking away their jobs. And they were hugely concerned. Did that stop the Industrial Revolution? No. Should it have stopped the Industrial Revolution? Not at all. Because it was the Industrial Revolution that led to the Consumer Revolution that gave us abundance, that gave us everything that we have today. So there will definitely be changes in the job market. And there will be definitely be changes in terms of what we value. And I think it will change for the better. I mean, you think about 3D printing. What's 3D printing going to do for all those people who make stuff? When you can 3D print it at home, it's going to completely change that market, isn't it? Why are you going to have loads of factories with people producing plastic goods when you can print it at home? So the world is changing anyway. And I think what I'm hoping, and this is my belief, what materialism did for standards of living in the 20th century, which was just revolutionised them in a way that just had never happened in the whole of human existence, I think experientialism can do that for quality of life in the 21st century. We could end up in this age of leisure, which Keynes talked about back in the 30s. That's what I hope. Okay, why don't we thank our speaker today?